Fantastic. Beautiful. Love seeing these young people doing so many wonderful things in the church, don't you? Yes. Amen. That's awesome. Well, I want to just uh, begin with a word of prayer before we get into today's message. Just very quickly, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you that you have brought us here again to spend time reflecting on how great your faithfulness is. In the words of the song we just heard played instrumentally, because of your faithfulness, the weak can proclaim they are strong, and the poor can complain they are rich because of what the Lord has done for us. So Lord, we pray that we will be renewed in our understanding of that truth today. Use me to speak what you want to speak into the hearts and lives of each person here. Bypass any hindrance that would be in me to that. And Lord, I pray that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. I met Maria in Cuba. Last October, I went on a Cuban mission trip. Now, at that time, that was the last time my hair was this length. I have to say, I'm kind of liking it. I told my wife to, this morning, I said to her, I said, uh, it's going to take me a while to get my hair ready for church. <laughs> and she laughed and then gave me a dirty look because it takes a while to get her hair ready for church. And, uh, and so uh, I, I, I kind of like this, but I, I had it this short because, of course, going to Cuba, I didn't know what the conditions would be, but I knew they would be uh, harsh in some of the places we went. I was going with a mission organization that supports Adventist mission uh, to a network of house churches across Cuba from the north part of the island, north uh, west part of the island to the southeast part of the island. And um, we went literally uh, to a whole bunch of house churches in the north part and then we flew to the southern part of the, con the conference or the, the country I should say and went to a whole bunch of house churches there. And in fact we went all the way up to this mountain and we were the first foreigners that this village of 750 had ever seen. The first foreigners. And it was no wonder why we were the first foreigners. It was a brutal trip. But uh, it was a fun trip and, and an exhilarating trip to see God at work in the lives of these dear people who were giving everything to serve God. Do you know that the average Cuban makes between 12 and $18 a month? 
a, a, a medical doctor is at the top end and makes $18 a month. Part of the Cuban economy, because everything is government run and it's a, uh, it, it's a communist country, part of the economy is that people will take part of their day they're supposed to be working for the government and they will barter and trade that which they steal from their workplace. So if you work in a bakery, you'll take a little extra flour or sugar or oil and you will barter or sell or trade that for something else that you need. Perhaps the person who works in the construction company and you're needing to do something to the house you're, fix you're, you're living in and there's a repair that needs to be made and you will trade what you can get from the bakery, which they need, for what they can get from their construction company, which you need. And that's the way that they operate. But our churches, our, our people who operate our churches, struggle immensely. And that's what this mission organization was all about, supporting and helping these people. It's called um, Changing People's Lives International. And they work with communist countries in particular in helping with this. Look them up on the internet excellent company but I went with them and I met Maria I met Maria last October and we drove up to Maria's house and Maria did not know we were coming our director had not told her we would be coming for a visit he just wanted to pop in and see what Maria was up to and how the work was going he didn't want her to prepare and be able to somehow spin the you know how things were going he just wanted a surprise visit which we did quite a number of times and so we drove up and we got there and we knocked on the door and we had to knock several times because Maria was in the backyard and she was working in her little tiny garden space which was just very tiny but yet she depended on and so she was back there she heard us at the door and finally came to the door and when she opened the door Maria just stood there aghast just and I wondered what's going to happen and finally, a smile broke across her face, and she got excited. She said, you've come back. You've come back. I can't believe you've come back. And then Maria showed us around her house. Now, it's very interesting. Her house was smaller than this platform. Her house was probably, well, I shouldn't say that. The house was probably the size of the platform, but she lived in a space from here over, a, a space from here over. And there was a bedroom there with a very small full-size bed that her and her husband uh, had and then there was in the corner of that little bedroom a sewing machine that she made things for the people that she was working with and then there was a little tiny kitchen that was that was smaller than the size of this piano and then there there was this area here it was about this size probably and that was two rows of chairs that was the church most of her home was dedicated to the church. It was incredible. In fact, everything about Maria's life was dedicated to the church. And, and she cried and bawled just almost incessantly as she showed us the things that she had made and was giving away to orphans and to, to very, very poor and destitute families in the community that she was reaching out to, things that she had sewed and, and patched up to give to them. She, she told us about the, the little VBSs that she would do in her community, and she showed us some of the crafts she had made and the things that she would do with the children. And then she showed us things that children had made that, that were saying that they loved Jesus and they were so grateful that she had shared Jesus with them. And, and, and then she showed us a little tin box. And this was when she began to sob uncontrollably. We wondered, what, what's going on here? What, what is she doing? What's the problem? And she just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. As she held this little tin box, we could see that the box was burnt. And then she opened the lid of this tin box and inside you could see that she had been burning inside and it was just ashes, leftover ashes. And she began to tell us in her halting Cuban Spanish, the story of the ashes of that morning. She said, these are my prayers. I write them down. 
I write down the prayers that I'm praying for, and then I pray to my God to answer these prayers. And as I pray to my God to answer these prayers, I don't know how He's going to do it, but I just know He will. And this morning, I was praying for all the different people that I've been working with and praying for this little church that God has given me here and praying that, that God would somehow provide because I'm out of money, I have no way to continue this work, and I had no idea what I would do. And then she began to talk about how that morning she had prayed that God would somehow give her a breakthrough because she just didn't think she could go on. She had no idea we were coming. And Lorenzo said to her, uh, Lozano is his name, said to her, he's our director, he said, listen, he said, we have come to provide you with a monthly stipend to continue to support the work. But what's more, she had told us that one of the prayers in there was that her sewing machine had, had started to break down and she needed a certain part for it and it needed to be repaired and it was going to cost $40. In Cuba, you can't bring anything in. Everything has to be within the country. You, drive, you go around Cuba and, and the cars are like 1950s cars. Only a 1950s Ford will have the parts from every other kind of car and homemade parts to, parts to boot. And so uh, she was saying how she had needed a part and needed her sewing machine fixed so she could continue the, the outreach ministry she used it for. And, and Lozano, Eliseo Lozano said, that's okay, we're going to give you the money to fix the machine. And he handed her the equivalent of the $50 in her money that she would need. Now remember, how much do they get a month? How much do they make a month? For her, about $12. Four months' wages to fix the machine. He gave her some more money for some other things that she needed, and she just began to sob more and more and more. I expected that she would be joyful and then happy, but she was so happy, so overwhelmed, that it was actually sobbing. And then finally, she, she started to tell her story. Lozano said, tell us your story. And she said, oh, my, it's my story that makes this so overwhelming. When I was young, my father was killed and my mother had a difficult time taking care of us and I had to become a prostitute as a older girl, young teen. And it was a horrible time of my life. And I thought there would be no hope for me. And she just sobbed and sobbed as she told her story. And then she said, Somehow, somebody who was a person of God came along and they helped me. And they helped me to get out of that. And, 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 that, and then I met the Seventh-day Adventists. And the Seventh-day Adventists helped me to understand who Jesus is and what Jesus wants to do in my life and what a difference it could make and how I could use the abilities that God has given me to serve Him. And I've given everything for Him. Because he's given everything for me. And we stood there, us five men who were there, with tears running down our cheeks, feeling quite selfish and self-centered about our lives. Because we give our little bit that won't affect our lives for God. And we think we're doing quite a lot. Finally, we had prayer with Maria, and then we hugged her, and yes, we hugged her, and she just melted in a pool, sobbing, and then we went on our way. There are many days, I think, of Maria. But what really strikes me most was that that very morning Maria was at the end of her rope. And us not knowing that and her not knowing that God had already sent us on a plane to Cuba, already sent us in the van toward her house, had prayed for and asked that God would bring a breakthrough. Isn't God good?
We sang, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It's not just a song. And it reminds me of another story in the Bible. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, another woman who had a great need, whose heart was breaking, who didn't know what to do next, her back was up against the wall. I invite you to turn there with me if you would like, 2 Kings chapter 4. And the, the Bible says that she was the wife of a man from the company of the prophets. And she cried out to Elisha when Elisha came, Your servant, my husband, is dead. So her husband had been a servant of the, the school of the prophets. My husband, your servant, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Our story starts on a sad note. A widow comes to the prophet Elisha, proceeds to tell him her problems, she, she bears her heart to him. Her husband, who has been a student of Elisha's in his school of prophets, has passed away, and now she is in financial straits. She doesn't know how she will face the next day, perhaps even the next hours. She has no money, no source of income. Her creditors are breathing down her net, neck, banging down her door, seeking payment, and she can't pay them. She has nothing, no way to give them what they need what they demand. None like today's creditors who threaten to take a person's house or haul away their vehicle. These creditors uh, would require somebody to work off the debt as a slave. Now, I don't know if she thought that Elisha might have the money to help her. I don't know. Or perhaps, uh, you know, she thought that Elisha might know somebody who, who might have the money to help her, or, or perhaps he would speak to the creditors on her behalf and, and help her out in that way. I don't know what she was thinking. Really, the text doesn't tell us. But she just needed someone to talk to and to share her burden with. Oftentimes, people just need somebody to share their burden with. And regardless of what she was looking for, somehow I doubt that she could have ever imagined what she would ultimately receive. Maria had no idea what was coming her way that day. This woman, in the story, she was looking for a crust and she got an entire loaf from God. And even more, she got the, the whole bakery. <laughs> Pay attention to the story. After she told Elisha what her problem was, he asked her, what can I do to help you? <laughs> I love that question. What can I do to help you? I mean, what do you want from me? Before she even has time to reply, he doesn't, he doesn't let her reply. He just replies on her behalf right, right off the bat because he knows what state she's in. But he wants her to know that it's not him who can help her. And so then he, re he responds immediately. He continues, tell me, what do you have in the house? Very interesting response. Here's a woman who's saying, I'm at the end of my rope. I have absolutely nothing. The creditors are going to come. They're going to take away my children. They might take away my house. I may be destitute on the street. I may be the prostitute, just like Maria had had to be. And so she thinks about it for a moment. And the text gives a very interesting reply. Just a little bottle of olive oil. That's all I've got. Little bottle of olive oil. Now notice what Elisha says next in verse 3. Elisha in verse 3 you know what? I didn't put it in my thing. So this is why you actually have a real Bible with you. <laughs> Elisha says in verse 3, go, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Interesting. So Elisha says, this is what I want you to do. Are you listening to me, he says? Are you listening? Now listen. I want you to go around to all your neighbors and relatives and borrow every container you can put your hands on. Tupperware, Rubbermaid. They had that then, didn't they? Okay, maybe not. Clay, glass, 
metal. It doesn't matter. You, you can use the cheap ones from the dollar, shaviva, whatever it would have been called. I probably just said a bad word in that language. I don't, I don't know. And then I want you to bring all the containers back to your house and go inside with your sons and close the door and start pouring the oil from your little jar into all the containers. <laughs> She's got to be thinking, oh, that's going to go well. I mean, I've got a little, I did tell you I have a little jar, right? A little jar. And when I start pouring, I mean, it's, it's not even going to fill the first container I get from my neighbors. She had to be thinking it. And then Elisha says, just set them aside as you fill them up. Just set them to the side and keep filling. What an odd, strange thing. I'm sure she looked at him like, you are, are you in your right mind? I said that I had a little bit of olive oil, not a lot of olive oil. But there must have been something in his words, or his look, or his attitude, because she sent the boys out to collect all the containers that they could find. And so they go out and they start collecting all the containers all through the neighborhood. Now, I don't know what they told their friends and neighbors that they needed the jugs for. <laughs> the truth would have sounded a little far-fetched, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, we're having hard times and we've got this little bottle of oil. And so we're going around the neighborhood and we're collecting all the jars and containers we can find so we can pour the oil from our little jar into all those jars. Okay, should we call the ambulance? You can only imagine. I, I canvassed, I did literature, summer student literature evangelist work for a summer in Newfoundland with my roommate from college who was what they call a newfie. In fact, when I went to college, I went into the dean's office coming from the U.S. up to Canada. It was all strange to me anyway. I thought, these Canadians have got to be weird. And uh, fortunately, I hadn't met my wife yet. And uh, she's not weird. And so I, I, I went into the dean's office, but the dean made it sound like the newfies were weird. Because he said, oh, you're in room such and such, and he's a newfie. And everybody in his office broke out in laughter. I had no idea what a newfie was. A newfie is simply somebody from Newfoundland. We would say Newfoundland, but they say Newfoundland. My mom sent me a birthday card there that summer, and when she sent the card, because I had said on, uh, on the phone what my address was, Newfoundland, she wrote, New Finn Land. It went to Finland. <laughs> it went to New Zealand. And in New Zealand, somebody wrote down, Auckland, New Zealand, Newfoundland, Newfoundland, they rewrote it, and they wrote in parentheses, near Canada. <laughs> I got my birthday card about a month later. It had New Zealand money in it. But, but I went around this little island with my friend, and, and the interesting thing about this island, it's like going to Ireland uh, 50 or 100 years ago. You go into these little coves, and, and it's just like stepping back in time. And, and the interesting thing that would happen was you would knock on the door, and everybody's watching from the windows and the doors. Everybody in the village knows you're there. Everybody knows what you're doing. They watch you walk from one place to the next. And if things went well at the first couple of homes you went to, things went well the rest of the day. If things didn't go well at the first home or two that you went to, forget it, move on. I imagine these little villages in Bible times were a lot like this and people had to be watching out their windows and watching through their doors as the widows, as the woman's sons and, and herself go door to door and they're carrying these containers and taking them home and then going back out and getting more containers and carrying them home until finally they decide, okay, we've got enough. And so when they had all they thought they needed, the boys brought the containers home, closed the door, and she tipped up her little jar of oil and started pouring. And the first container was filled to the brim. 
They couldn't believe it. The container was much bigger than her little vial of oil, and yet it filled the container to the brim. They set it aside, and, and they said, let's try another, let's try another. And so they went to another one, and they poured it in. And sure enough, it just kept pouring and pouring and pouring, and it came up to the brim. And they moved it aside, let's try another. And they did another one, and another, and they kept pouring and filling and pouring and filling until finally she ran out of containers to pour the oil into. And then and only then did she finally run out of oil. Now notice verse 6. Notice what verse 6 says. Verse 6 says this. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. And at that, then, then, say the word then with me, then, then. Sometimes the limitations we have in our lives are the then we have placed on our lives. Then the oil stopped flowing. I'm sure that she rushed to Elisha to tell Elisha the news that she could hardly believe what had happened. She could hardly believe how good her fortunes had been, just like Maria was sobbing and sobbing with a smile on her face and just, uh, just beside herself at the joy of, of God answering her prayer that morning in such an unexpected way. There was only one way to describe it, and that was it was a miracle. And finally, notice how verse 7 concludes the story. Verse 7, it says this, She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. This story of the widow and her two sons can give you and me the hope that we need. If God can provide for the debt and the need of this poor widow, or he can meet Maria's need when she has no idea how that need might be met, or he can use us to meet Maria's need, then he can use you to meet the need of another, or he can use another to meet your need. David said in Psalms that he had never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. God will take care of his own. She had to worry some, for she had tried to take care of business on her own, but the debt was too great. Sometimes we worry because we, we're trying to do it on our own. We're trying to figure out the solutions. And, and God doesn't want us just to, you know, not try to figure out solutions, but he wants us to come to him first on the front end of our challenges. And she had come to God at the end of her rope and needed help now. And, and, and so she finally comes to Elisha and she seeks God's help. And you know, God is so gracious, isn't he? Because even if we wait till the very last to come to him, he still meets our needs. There are several observations we can make about this story. First of all, she knew what she didn't have. Sometimes we, we are told what we don't have. We don't need people to tell us what we don't have. Sometimes people tell us where we fall short. We don't need people really most of the time to tell us where we fall short uh, unless we're acting like we don't know or like, like we don't believe it. Maybe sometimes it helps if somebody tells us a little truth, but a lot of the time that's not what's needed. She comes right out and she tells Elisha she has no money, she has no husband, possibly no children, no hope if something doesn't change. She knew what she didn't have, and in that regard, she may be a step ahead of some of us. We don't always want to admit where and how we're falling short, do we? We hold back. Now, according to Jewish tradition, this widow was the wife of Obadiah. Obadiah had hid the prophets by 50 in a cave in the times of Ahab, the Bible tells us, in the times of Ahab and Jezebel, and they had persecuted and attempted to kill every true prophet or teacher of the law of Moses because they were trying to set up their own religion. Her husband was well known to the prophets, and he was well known to Elisha to be a good man, one of the seven thousand who had bowed not the knee to Baal. Because of the faithfulness of her husband, she went to Elisha for help, believing my husband has a good reputation. He's respected. Surely Elisha will help me. This wasn't a, wasn't a woman who had squandered 
her income, who had squandered her resources. Nor was her husband a man who had done this. He had done his best to supply the needs of his family, to support the work of the ministry. In fact, it was his commitment to the work of God that played such a large part in the debt that he owed after his death, Jewish tradition says. This widow's husband, Obadiah, had supposedly taken his own money and spent it in the support of the prophets of God that had gone into hiding in a cave in order to escape King Ahab. And in using these resources that he had borrowed to do it, he put his wife and his sons in peril when he died. So to most of us, this scenario seems a little unfair. God's man, doing God's work, taking care of God's people, doesn't get any help from God, and then it's his own family that suffers in the end because he actually dies. What injustice that might have been in the eyes of man from man's perspective. Have you ever felt that way? I'm serving God. I mean, I'm doing everything God asked me to do. I'm, I'm giving of myself. Did Maria feel that way that morning? No, she didn't. She simply wanted more to serve God with. But do we feel that way in the comfort and the security of our lives when just a little bit of inconvenience comes along? Or when the real hurts and pains of life affect us. This widow is at the end of her rope and she knows it. And it's important to know it when we're at the end of our rope. I wonder this morning as we ponder this story and our own lives, what are you missing in your life? What is your need? What are, what, what's falling short for you? Is your back up against the wall in some way or another? You're wondering how the next day is going to go? Perhaps your needs are physical. Maybe sometimes you think, I would give everything I have if only I didn't have to suffer this pain or this illness. Last week, Eudine shared in the prayer why my hair is buzzed. It's buzzed because we have a young pastor, about 30 years of age, whose wife is pregnant to give birth in just, in just a few, a couple of months. And he got cancer a year ago, and they treated it, and they did a surgery, and it came back a couple months ago after she was pregnant. The pregnancy itself is a miracle due to the cancer that he has. It came back. It came back in the lymph system, and now he's undergoing an extremely rigorous, demanding chemotherapy. And a whole bunch of us pastors and some of us in the office shaved our heads in solidarity to show support. And every time I feel this, and every time I see my reflection anywhere, I send up a prayer for Nick. I ask you to pray for Nick. But sometimes we get to the end of our ropes, physically. But sometimes it's relationally. I don't know if we can go on in our relationship. I don't know if my husband and my wife or my, my kids and ourselves, I don't know if we can keep doing this. I don't know how to keep doing this. Sometimes our backs are up against the wall emotionally, just so drained and so worn down emotionally and so raw. I just don't know if I can go on. Isn't that how that mother in Dundee must have felt? And yet nobody knew she felt that emotionally drained. Or perhaps it's spiritually. Sometimes it's very obvious that our spiritual backs are against the wall. We're, we're, we act out rebelliously. We do things that are against God. We, we, we don't pay any attention to God. We just go about our lives and we do our own thing. And God is an appendage to our life. But sometimes we, we come to church and we, we put on the smile and we extend the hand. How are you doing? Happy Sabbath. Good to see you, Pastor Justin. How are you? I know you're great. 
we're not. We're not great at all, some of us. We're spiritually dry. We're, we're dying of thirst spiritually, some of us. Just like this woman, we're needing a breakthrough in one of those areas of our lives. And God says to you, as he did to the widow through Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 2, What can I do to help you? What can I do? Anything. Just, what is it? Has that, anyone ever asked you for help? And you felt like giving Elisha's response? <laughs> Elisha says, what can I do to help you? But the answer is obvious to the woman when she asks Elisha. The answer is obvious. She knows Elisha's a preacher. He doesn't have any money. Amen. <laughs> she knows Elisha is a teacher. Teachers don't have any money. Amen. My wife, when our kids were growing, she said, I don't know what I want to do now. She had taken elementary education in school. She said, I'm not sure I still want to be a teacher. What should I do? I said, I don't know, but do something that makes lots of money. <laughs> it's okay if you make twice as much as me. She became an Adventist teacher. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We don't know how long Elisha might have paused on that thought, and the text presents it as a rhetorical question, a question that doesn't expect an answer because the answer is nothing. What can Elisha do? And what does he do? Tell me what you have in the house, and what does, what's that answer? The answer, it, the obvious answer is nothing of any significance. I wouldn't be coming to you if I had anything of any significance. And, and that's an interesting point there because the truth is often we think we have nothing of significance to bring to the situation. But oil was like gold in their economy. Oil was worth a lot. I mean, oil could be used for all kinds of things. It could be used as a cosmetic. It could be used as a medicine. It could be used for food. It could be used as a fuel. It could be used as a source of light in darkness. It was used in religious rites for consecration, for offerings and burials. And, and oil was used for healings. And so you can understand that olive oil had a whole different value 3,000 years ago than it does today. And so that made olive oil a commodity of exchange that she hadn't considered. Nelson's New Illustrated Bible Dictionary says olive oil was one of the most important products in the economy of Palestine and in the daily life of the people. It became a symbol of peace and prosperity and it was looked upon as a blessing from God. She was blessed and didn't even know it. She thought the blessings were all gone. But the blessing was sitting in her cupboard. Isn't that the way that it is in our lives oftentimes? When we're lacking, when we, when we think that we just don't have anything to bring to the table anymore, we still have something of value. We still have something to contribute. We have some health, or else we'd be dead. Amen? Turn to the person next to you, say, you're not dead yet. I saw the look some of you gave like, oh brother, there he goes again, rolling your eyes. Aren't you glad you're not dead yet? I'm especially glad since you're sitting here. <laughs> we have some self-control or we'd be living in an alley somewhere. We have some capacity for forgiveness or we'd be running around with a gun eliminating every irritant. We have some hope 
Or we'd be like that poor wife and mother from Dundee who ended her life in hopelessness. And so again in 2 Kings 3 verse 4 verses 3 and 4 Elisha says borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors then go into your house with your sons shut the door behind you pour olive oil from your flask into the jars a flask into jars setting the jars aside as they are filled that does seem a little strange doesn't it but let's face it, at this point, she doesn't have many options. She can tell her son, sell her sons into slavery, which still happens today in many parts of the world, by the way. When I was in Cuba on that mission trip, we stayed in a hotel. And as we turned into the hotel, there were young women, girls, from probably about 14, 15 to 21, 22. There were a few boys standing in that line. And I said, what's that in my ignorance? They told me what it was and my stomach turned and I became sick and in the morning I saw these old European men and old North American men in the lobbies and at breakfast with those who were standing in that lineup, laughing and pretending like they were having a good time. Well, maybe they were in their own minds, but not those poor kids with them. The woman's facing that. This is tough stuff. Or she could do what Elisha was saying, crazy as it may seem. But Elisha knows what he's doing. And he knew what he was doing in this woman's life. God is asking the woman to do what she can. So often we give up before we've done everything we can, don't we? There's nothing I can do. I can't do any more. Now I'm not talking about humanistic, self-centered attitude of I'm going to figure this out myself. I can do it myself. I don't need anything else and I don't need God. No, that's the point of all of this. Rather, after consulting God, after seeking His direction, when He points us in a particular direction, then it's time for us to move. Time for us to act on it. Time for us to do what we can do that he's given us the ability and the resources to do that he's commissioning us to do. Go to your neighbors and get the containers. The woman thought she didn't have much to contribute anymore. She thought she had nothing to solve her problem with. But in God's hand, her little was much. Amen? Imagine what it must have been like Going those to those doors, as we said a few minutes ago. <laughs> uh, incredible. Why would God have decided to meet the woman and her sons this way? As I thought about this and prayed about this, preparing for this message yesterday, I, I, the thought came to me, maybe God was saying to the woman through the prophet Elisha, Lady, You've got a whole lot of emptiness in your life. But not enough emptiness. It's a strange thought, isn't it? You've got a lot of emptiness in your life, but not enough emptiness. So gather together some more emptiness. Go back to your empty house and your empty cupboards and close the door behind you once you've gathered a whole bunch of more emptiness and, and, and gather those two boys close to you and then take the little that you have and, and pour it into all that emptiness. We've all experienced emptiness of one form or another, haven't we? And yet, God is saying to us, listen, keep offering me your emptiness and I'll fill you up. Give me your emptiness and I'll fill you up. Gather some more emptiness and I'll fill that up too. Get all your neighbor's emptiness and bring it into your house and I'll fill up all their emptiness. I'll fill it all up with my Holy Spirit. 
And so the story continues. The widow sets out all of those empty jars, and sure enough, they're all filled. And, 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 and she, she goes through that whole process. And we discover from this story that God used what she did have to provide what she didn't have. God could have simply provided her with gallons and gallons of olive oil. That wouldn't have been a problem for God. Elisha could have said, go home and, and there will be more olive oil in your house than you can ever use. And she could have gone home and there it could have been. The cupboards all could have been filled with olive oil. Every nook and cranny of the house could have had olive oil in containers. But that, that wouldn't have used what she could contribute. It's a stewardship lesson here as well, by the way. You've been noticing our church budget on the back of the bulletin each week, haven't you? There are things this church can do in this community. There are things this church can do in people's lives to make a difference. But not without us doing all we can each do. Most of the time, God works through people. Noah actually had to build the ark. God didn't just go, bing, there's an ark. And it was a long process, 120 years, building an ark for something nobody had ever even thought of happening. Moses, Moses had to stretch out his rod for the Red Sea to be parted. God didn't just open it up before them and make it easy and, and, and not require their faith, not require them to come to him and plead with him. Joshua and the Israelites, they had to march around Jericho before the walls fell. God could have had them walk up and God could have said, and the walls could have gone, boom. But he didn't. He had something for them to do. And when Jesus fed the 5,000, Jesus could have blinked. He could have said that prayer to God and everybody could have had sitting in their lap loaves and fishes, veggie fishes, <laughs> sitting in their laps for lunch. But he didn't. It was after the little boy gave his lunch and the disciples went around to distribute it. And everybody did their part. God did his part when the widow did his, her part, and that's the same in our lives too. God wants us to do everything we can and then ask him to make up the difference and do everything he wants to. And everything we can is simply to be an offering to him, not about some self-centered humanistic accomplishment. Because God chooses to partner with us in accomplishing his purposes. God could have forgiven everybody. But he wants us to ask for forgiveness. And accept the gift of forgiveness. And choose to live a life in relationship with him. God could take away our will and he could replace it with his will. But he doesn't because he wants it to be our choice. I went up to my wife after we had dated for 10 months. We went on a walk to this lake and it was a beautiful place. And I had had in my mind, I'm going to ask her to marry me. I had never hinted that idea to her. You can see where this is going. And so we got to this beautiful spot on the lake and it was sunset. And I said, sweetheart, I said, I want to ask you a question. It's an important question. Oh, okay. I should have got the hint there. But I was a little thick. And so I said, sweetheart, I said, would you marry me? And she got this look of fear on her face. <laughs> that wasn't the expression I'd been hoping for. When I'd rehearsed it in my mind, I hadn't imagined that expression. And the first answer out of her mouth was not what I had anticipated. And it was immediate. There was no pause, no careful thought of, oh, yes, I will. It was, when? When? <laughs> 
And next she said, I'll have to think about it. I knew right then I'd made a mistake. I should have said, sweetheart, you are marrying me. <laughs> but how would that have gone? <laughs> Differently. <laughs> yes. I had to go away on a weekend science and religion field trip to the Rockies where we looked at fossils in the rocks of fish. And I don't know, but people who say there was no flood have some other explanation for how fish fossils got into the Rocky Mountains. But we went there and I had to wait all weekend until I came back before she gave me an answer. When I came back, she came running to me. She said, I do, I do, I will. And I was so happy. What I didn't know was that when I called her parents, they told me, oh yes, we've been praying about this for three days. You can marry her. She had called everybody she knew. <laughs> but there's an important principle here. It's it only, love only works and commitment in relationship only works when it's by choice. And here's the secret of the entire story. The widow was only limited by her, choose, her choice to believe. When she got to the end of the containers that she had collected, she ran out of oil. Had she collected fewer containers, she would have run out earlier. But had she collected even more containers, she would have been blessed even more. I wonder if when the oil ran out, she said, Oh no! What would it have taken for her to have found more jugs and bottles and jars? Would she and her boys have had to walk a little further and ask a few more people? Would, they, would it have been worth it if they had? Only she would be able to answer that question. So here's my question for us today. How much do we want to be blessed by God? Because here's the truth. If you give little... If you pray little, if you attempt little with God, then you will get little, and you will experience God little, and you will accomplish little with him. But if you give much, like Maria, and if you pray much, like Maria, and if you attempt much, like Maria, then you will get much like Maria, and you will experience much like Maria, and you will be blessed much like Maria, because we gave her a salary equal monthly to what a doctor makes to continue sharing Jesus with others. And do you know what she said? Oh, this is so wonderful. Now I'll be able to give even more away. Notice what happened in verse 7. When the woman told the man of God what had happened, she said to, he said to her, How, Now sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what is left over. <laughs> this is God's way. This is what Jesus came to demonstrate in his life and ministry. Just bring a lunch basket to him and he'll feed thousands. Just have a little faith the size of a mustard seed and he'll heal you. He'll raise your loved one, your child, your brother, your father. We saw it throughout scripture from the dead. Have a little faith and he'll walk, he'll walk on water to you in the midst of your storms and stand up in the, in the boat of your life and he will order the elements to be still. Just have a little faith and he'll forgive you for what you can't forgive yourself for. And he'll heal you and transform your life and use you because he wants you to be all that he saw in you to begin with. Give all you have. Give all you can. And stand amazed as God does more with it and with you than you ever imagined as he has with Maria. 
<laughs> in her backyard. You know what was in her backyard right beside her little garden space? Her backyard consisted of two things. A garden space to grow fruits, a, a little tree with some fruit on it. I don't remember what the fruit was. And a garden for some vegetables. And then the other half of her backyard, you know what it was? It was a baptistry. Where the people she was working with in the town were baptized one after another after another and came to fill this space in her house which was bigger than what she lived in and it gave her the greatest joy in her life more than she'd ever imagined. Listen to this promise as we close. Ephesians 3.20 Now glory be to God by his mighty power at work within us. He is able to accomplish infinitely more than we would even dare to ask or hope for. Whew. What is it you're lacking in your life today? If you empty yourself before God, this story is telling us, he will fill you more and more and more beyond your greatest imagination. What is it that you desire to see God do in your life and through this church? I've got one more time with you in one month. First Sabbath of September. But when I come back a year from now or whenever it is I come back, man, I, I, I just, I want to see every pew in this place filled because the Spirit of God is so strong, so present, so powerful. People's needs are being met so significantly. People are, are, are experiencing God and is moving in their lives and in this church, which means in your lives so markedly that they are just compelled to be part of this. So go ahead. Give it a try. You think all you got's empties? <laughs> well, if you take your empties to Costco, I found, to Costco, I gotta say it right, to Costco, I found you can put them in this machine and that which is seemingly worthless, this piece of empty plastic, you put it in the machine and it pops out money. <laughs> You may think you don't have much to offer, that your life just has a lot of emptiness. You may think, hey, there's a lot of emptiness in this church. I mean, look around at all the empty spaces. Offer your emptiness to God. Cash it in. Cash in what you have. And watch God work beyond your imagination and overflow in your lives and in this church. Let's pray. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. There is nothing in our lives that you are not already faithful, faithful in meeting our need before we even fully understand it or we ask. Just like Maria's prayers that morning, you had already put into action months before the plan for us to be at her door just an hour after that prayer to answer the prayer that would be on her heart that day before she ever knew she would be needing to pray that prayer. Oh God, there is nothing that is beyond your ability. And so, Lord, we pray. Like with this widow who was terrified her sons may become slaves to pay off her debt. Like with Maria who was terrified of what it might mean for her life and for the ministry you called her to if she didn't get a breakthrough. Like for so many of us who experience various forms of emptiness in our own lives. Meet us where we are. And in the same way as you did for Maria and for this woman with Elisha, we pray that you will fill our lives and fill this church to overflowing. And Lord, may it be
for your honor and glory alone. Amen.